Hi guys and welcome to Introduction to Healing. In this session of Introduction to Healing, we're going to go over an introduction to Vipassana, uh, which is a form of meditation that is taught in a lot of centers around the world. Uh, for me, Vipassana is, it, it holds a special place because I think that it was one of the first really kind of strict formal meditations that I had embarked on attempting to learn or to experience. Um, as I tell you my experience, um, I think it's important to be able to share someone's experience. At the same time, I want to kind of put a disclaimer out there uh, from, from this aspect that a big part of learning how to meditate in this way is all about observing what is, not paying attention to our story of what is. And, and, and to begin seeing the world the way it is and accepting it the way it is as opposed to the way that we would want it. So when I tell the story, it, it, it's not meant to flavor uh, your perception of Vipassana in a way that says, look, this is what you can expect. But I do think my story can be very helpful in, in demonstrating or at least, you know, uh, presenting it in such a way that it can help describe some of the mechanisms that are kind of occurring as you embark on this type of meditative journey. So for, for me, again, maybe very different from a lot of people, uh, I had come from an ADHD background, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, you know, moving, you know, just, you know, not being able to be still as a child. There's a lot of things that come with the symptoms of ADHD that resonated with me and were a part of my, my background and my experience. I had uh, been encouraged to go see a psychiatrist when I was in my 30s. And I think within 15 minutes of questioning, he decided that I was, you know, a poster child for ADHD and he had me on a, uh, a prescription of Adderall XR. And I think that I began with maybe 20 milligrams or 10, 10 or 20 milligrams, and that ended up going up to 30, and that went up to 40. And, you know, I, I think that my wife, bless her heart, you know, the fact that she stayed with me during that time period, like my experience of being on that type of upper medication and my, my understanding of ADHD has evolved over time. Um, oh my God, I was, I, I, I had to be really difficult because uh, it, it, it was speeding me up in such a way that I didn't have patience with people that, you know, I thought were slower, even though they, they might not have been, you know. So, I mean, it was an interesting time period enough that I was grateful for the experience. But very quickly in my own research, I figured out that it, that the medication was not for me. And I, I ended up taking myself off the medication and crashing for like a week. What I've come to learn since is that there's a comorbidity. In other words, symptoms are the same between what we call ADHD and unprocessed childhood trauma. And in my particular background, I had some unprocessed childhood trauma. And it, it's just interesting to see how that played out, you know, over the years. It's, it's enough of a warning that I would say that anybody that says or thinks that they're struggling from ADHD should at least go do some inquiry with trauma work and, you know, is it possible for me to, to downregulate this, to process this in such a way that I don't, I don't hold things in the same way and therefore don't have the same reactions, you know, mentally, emotionally, and physically. So for, for me, after I had just been through this medication experience, uh, Vipassana came up and it was suggested to me by a friend and I was really, really interested in meditation. I'd done a, a lot of different other types of meditation, mostly probably, um, you know, visualization. I had done some kind of out there stuff like Merkaba meditation that had got me really quiet also. It was just really interesting uh, to hear about this and to know that there was a place that was in um, southeast of, of Dallas uh, that... I could go to that they didn't even charge any money. Everything was donation based. And I don't think that they would even take a donation from you and, or still don't unless you had been through their particular program. And so it, this program had nothing to do with any form of religion. It was just learning a specific technique. So the background that I know of Vipassana, it, it was begun by a gentleman by the name of Essen Gwinka. And Essen Goenka was an Indian man, businessman that struggled 
horribly with migraine headaches and he had been to every doctor in the world. Long story short, he was taught meditation and it had such an impact on him that he kind of made it his life mission to, that he began helping open these centers that began opening all over the world. So we have one in Kaufman, Texas, you know, just kind of southeast of Dallas. I, I went online and had to apply. You had to answer a bunch of questions. And I got scheduled to go to one. It was in their beginning years. So like they've really built out that place since then. Uh, and I was I was approved to go to go there and I scheduled it and I showed up. So this is a what's what's known as a 10 day silent retreat. And silent means that after a certain moment after the first day, you agree to go into noble silence, which basically means that from that time period until we, you know, come out of the noble silence at the end, you know, towards the end of the program, you agree not to not to talk and not even to make eye contact really with the other participants as well. On top of that, you're going to this location that's very remote. You know, once you cross kind of the, the parking lot, you know, in the office, they, they took your cell phone. You were instructed not to read any reading material, any reading material, no digital, you know, help or format, to, you know, at all. Uh, I think you could bring a, you know, a journal, you know, so generally there was a pamphlet about what you were going to experience that you had with you. But other than that, that was it, you know, so towards the first day, towards the end of the day, after kind of an orientation and the entire program has an uh, an audio that is played periodically giving instruction from uh, Essen Goenka, who has now passed on, but the but his audios are still used to this day. And every night of the program, they would, in the meditation hall, they would play a video where Essen Goenka would, you know, uh, give you this discourse of, oh, hey, this is what you went through today. And it was spot on. Like he he knew what you were going through and was still giving those instructions. So the, the discourse was was a very comforting thing because in, in counseling, one of the things, you know, they teach you in Counseling Theories 101 is the number one reason why people get better in counseling, whatever type of counseling it is, is because they feel understood. So for S. Goenka to come on this video and for all of us, you know, to, to watch it, and him describe where you're at, what you're going through, and and how you hold that, and what you can do with that, you know, was was really a comforting aspect of, of feeling like you were understood. So the first three days of this process, um, and and again, I'm I'm describing my experience of my first uh, vipassana ten day, right? Uh, Swami Kaleshwar once said that uh, not to put your own marsala. On things. So marsala is a spice. It's an Indian spice. Uh, what that means, not to put your own marsala on things, is to not put your own spin, your own exaggerations in order to entertain people, you know. So I want to share my experience. At the same time, it was my experience. And there's a certain aspect of this meditation that we want to just observe what is and not decide ahead of time what's going to be. That being said... Let me let me explain a little bit of, of my, my experience of the first one. And then also a uh, second time that I went for in a completely other, you know, 10 day as well. So the first three days, we are given really amazing instruction on uh, on a meditation process known as Anapana. And Anapana is where you're basically bringing your attention and you're just paying attention to this triangle beneath the nostrils, inside the nostrils, around the nostrils, and on the upper lip and above the upper lip, you know, and in between that space. So you're, you're focusing on sensation. You're focusing on what's here. What is it that you feel? Do you feel the air? Do, what's the sound? Like it's all, you know, body-based or a present moment where you're just focusing on this. And the instruction is where Essen Goenka is is bringing you back. He's saying, start again, start again, start again, bringing your attention back to this particular place. And he's giving a really great instruction on, on doing that, you know. So for me, my Marsala, for me, my experience was, you know, coming from background of ADHD, I'm trying to pay attention to this, you know. At the same time, we each have our own little area that we're kind of assigned in the meditation hall. And, I, you know, I was a massage therapist at the time with all of this knowledge about why muscles hurt and things like that. 
And I was so uncomfortable because they were asking me to try to be still. And that just wasn't the way that I processed reality, right? So it, it was like, uh, I, I, I built myself a throne of pillows. And I, I'm sure other people may not have struggled as much as I did the first time I did this particular type of meditation. But I just, I could not get comfortable. What I've come to learn is that this is a part of the process of conditioning the body and the mind to do something differently, right? And there's a lot of ways to do that. For in, in this way, often when there's an incoherence between the mind and the heart or the mind and the, the way the body is holding our conditioned story, then the movement can be a way to have a language where we can process something, one of many different languages. So when we attempt to, to be still, there's, there's things that are going to come up that we have to deal with, and they're going to manifest in the body in very specific ways. And so three days of Anapana where, you know, we're, we start off with short meditations. We're giving a lot of rest. I had amazing sleep, you know, that I probably never get while I was there. And, and so for three days, you're asked to keep bringing your, your attention back to just this one space. So you begin not paying attention to other things because you're, you're conditioning your mind to focus on just this right here. Now, for me, that was difficult. The first day, focus this, focus this, my mind wandered. It was gone for maybe 20 minutes or so. And then I, I bring it back, bring it back. That will get the instruction, bring it back. Then it wandered again, 20 minutes. And I did this, you know, all day. It was very, in, and probably more in the story about how uncomfortable I was than the ability to actually pay attention. The second day, it was interesting because my mind would wander for 10 minutes and then I would bring it back and then wander for 10 minutes and all day long. This is kind of the pattern of things as well. And then for me on the third day, I experienced moment throughout that third day where my mind didn't wander as much and it actually was staying where I wanted it to be. So Anapana, the first three days, you know, divided up in, in a lot of different little bitty sessions was um, it was very instrumental in building a flashlight of your consciousness. It's like taking the floodlight of everything that we're paying attention to and, and being able to focus it in a particular way because we know that the mind does what the mind expects to do. You know, we there, there's metaphoric examples of the Tetris effect where students were in studies were, were asked to play Tetris for three hours and then after they finished playing, they began having daydreams of those shapes of the video game Tetris coming out of the, you know, the background and, and it, you know, seeing that in their normal day life. The brain is going to do what the brain expects to do. This is the purpose of having an ongoing practice, no matter what it is, is because it conditions the mind. And specifically what we're doing is we're coming out of the story into the present moment, out of the story. And we're, we're just observing what is. And by paying attention to sensation, sensation is happening when? It's always happening in the now. So sensation is something that we can pay attention to that's always going to be in the now, right? That's why it's such a great thing. Body-based aspects are going are gonna to take us out of an abstract story unless, unless we want to add that to what we're feeling in the now as well. So three days, you've now created this, you know, uh, spotlight, uh, flashlight of consciousness. And on the fourth day, we begin, so just, just being able to get to that point to where my mind didn't wonder. For somebody that came from an ADHD background, you don't understand how golden that was for me. That was like, what is this? This is really interesting. Because when you can actually be still, there's a lot of energy that you are spending going different directions that suddenly begins to get returned to you. And you begin feeling that as well. At least that was my experience. Again, not my own masala. Fourth day, you begin now taking that flashlight and you begin Vipassana. And Vipassana is, it, they begin in a particular way where we begin, you know, uh, in scanning the outside of the body. And as the discourse and as the instructions progress, we eventually begin scanning the inside of the body also. Now, this wasn't the way that Essen Goenka described it, but one of the metaphors that I've has always spoken to me about doing a scan is is kind of like you're you're doing a 3D fax, 
you know, and and I like the the imagery of a screen. You know, it's kind of like a a gold miner that's doing a screen in the river, and he's you know panning for gold. It's like it, you, your screens are either really really big squares or they're really really little squares, right? You're screening for something, so it's like you're sending that screen through the body, and it's going through that density of the body. And you'll notice that if you imagine that those screen squares are really really big, you can kind of move through the body pretty quickly. But if you tighten them up and make them small, I'll be like, because there's kind of a density to that. So for me, and again, this is my imagination visualization. And, and it's just, it's a helpful metaphor for me because what I discovered was I was really, really uncomfortable. And I, I think of my own body kind of like a clay mannequin. It's like we have this heaviness, this density when we're really, really struggling, when we feel bad, do most people feel heavy or light? And this is what we begin talking about, you know, energy psychology and energy work. When you're struggling, you're in depression, you're in anxiety, what do you, there's a, there's a reaction, there's a density, there's a trigger, there's something that has a charge that often can feel like, you know, a punch in the gut, a certain amount of heaviness, it can feel like a gaping hole, a wound. There's a lot of different examples of what it, but it's a felt sense in the body unless we've disassociated from it. And so that's something to kind of know that this association can be a contraindication for certain types of meditation uh, because it, you can go into more disassociation as opposed to what we're attempting to do is get in touch with the felt sense. And so the felt sense is like paying attention to what's actually here. So here's the metaphor I'm going to use. You start off as kind of this clay mannequin and you keep looking, you keep looking and, you know, it, it breaks up. It's like, oh, well, I've got this ache or this, you know, whatever in my mid back where I hold my mental burden or whatever. And it's like you just broke up that clay mannequin into big boulders. And you keep looking and you keep looking about what's really, really here. And those boulders break up into really, really larger rocks just through the power of observation. Now, we're not attempting to make anything happen. That's a big disclaimer. All we're doing is observing. But as we begin paying attention to what is, a most amazing thing begins happening. We stop paying attention to the story of what is or what actually isn't, right? And the energy that we're utilizing to create that felt sense of suffering begins getting returned to us and we begin to feel something different. And so we keep looking, we keep looking, we keep looking, and the rocks become smaller rocks. And we keep looking, we keep looking, we keep looking, and the smaller rocks become pebbles. And we keep looking, we keep looking, we keep looking, and the pebbles become sand. And we keep looking, we keep looking, we keep looking, and the sand becomes energy. So what I am saying outright with my own kind of marsala, and, and take that with a grain of salt, is that there, there is a way for us to tune into a frequency of energy to where, you know, if you look at the science of the atom, there's more space energy wave there, uh, you know, subatomic, you know, uh, uh, microscope. There's more space energy wave there than there is particle of matter. That's science. Like that isn't that that isn't woo woo. That's what it actually looks like. If we took the atom and made the nucleus the size of an SUV and looked at the space around that atom that an electron could pop in and out of existence, you would be looking at approximately eighty five thousand square miles compared to an SUV. Right. That's a lot of space. Right. So that's what we have the ability to tune into, like a radio dial, the frequency. Right. But in order to tune into that energy. Uh, that perception, that vibration, that frequency, you've got to stop paying attention to the story that's creating the heaviness, right? So instead of the thought creating the emotion, we begin focusing on a thing, on something in a very specific way, and it, it stops how we were creating energy previously. And so on for me, the seventh day, and again, my story, not other people's, uh, the seventh day, I reached a free flow in my body. Right. And I, I had never experienced that before. And like the purpose of meditation is freedom. Freedom from what? Well, there, there's a popular book in, in trauma processing. It's called The Body Keeps Score. And, and if we were really truly to, to throw out there a golden mental emotional rule, it's that the body is is keeping the story of our traumas, our, anxi our anxieties. The body is keeping score that if we can downregulate and eliminate the charge in the body or, or our felt sense of the charge in the body, 
Well, then we're not suffering anymore. Because if you're not, if you don't have an uncomfortableness in the body, guess what? There's no, if, if there's no charge in the body, then you don't have the heaviness. If you don't have the heaviness, well, what do we call that? If you, if you still think you have an issue, but without a charge in the body, well, you're, you're not suffering. So it really, now it's really just, it's wisdom. You understand things a little bit more. So this is our goal. Like the purpose of meditating is freedom, freedom from suffering. And suffering is so often self-created, self-imposed through the process of our own imagination, advanced abstract reality, and, you know, a huge, you know, advanced imagination as well. So my experience with Vipassana was a freshness of the chest that I had never had before. Now, almost everyone I've ever seen come back, personal experience, it's like they come back and they just want to share, they want to process, they want to share this with everybody, you know, and, but if you don't keep up a practice, guess what goes away, you know, so there's always, you know, there, there tends to be, unless people really, you know, keep a practice, and, and I think Vipassana, they ask you to meditate an hour, you know, in the morning, an hour in the evening, like two hours a day, uh, and, and, and individuals that I've known that, that do this are some of the sweetest, gentlest, you know, most thoughtful, considerate people I know, because the reality is, is that if you can truly be present, and if you're training your brain by paying attention to the felt sense of the body through body scanning in this way, then you, you can handle just about anything. Why? Because there's a lot of space there. Like we were talking about the energy, right? Viktor Frankl says the space between the stimulus and the reaction is the freedom to choose the life that you really want. Instead of, honestly, the one that's dragging us, kicking and screaming much of the time. A little bit of space. There's a big difference between being in the campfire and getting your body burned up and being up on the branch, enjoying, you know, looking down from the tree and looking at that amazing campfire. Well, maybe you'll, you'll get a lawn chair. But you understand, there's space there between what's causing us to react in a very specific way. And, and it gives us an enormous amount of ability to cope. Uh, and, and that's why presence and practicing presence is the, the first pillar of a lot of my coaching. Whether it's, it's pointing to Vipassana, whether it's practicing mindfulness, whether it's mantra meditation, whatever, you know, quantum meditation, Dr. Joe, whatever type of meditation it is, this is the purpose for it, is to create space and to basically give us more room so that we can, we can catch things and we can, we can kind of melt our suffering. So that's my quick review of, I say quick, Vipassana. Um, it's definitely something that I recommend. Uh, it tends to be stricter than a lot of other types. Like uh, one, you're, you are encouraged to sit still. And, you know, I think it's nine days before they bring in the metta, metta meaning loving kindness, you know, whereas uh, we introduced that in, in some other ways a little bit earlier. Uh, and, and loving kindness is another way of learning how to be with yourself with intent and the creation of meaning to it, it's like we need to be aware, but we also have to have compassion. These are the, the two wings of mindfulness that we have to have in order to get this thing to fly and get off the ground. So the second time that I went back for a 10 day, it was right before my daughter was going to be born. And I had this ridiculous notion that, you know, I wanted to process all of my stuff so that and, and here's here's the reason. And we asked this question in MBSR. We ask it in any type of stress reduction class or clientele. Why are you here? Why are you here to you know process? Why are you here for a stress reduction class? Why do you want to learn this? Why are you here? And then the second question we ask is, why are you really here? And then the third question is, why are you really, really here, right? So for me, I'm like, well, I want to stress reduce. Well, why are you really here? Well, I'm about to have a daughter. And honestly, I want to melt the, the, the bad dad 2.0 that was downloaded into me. And I want to, up, I want to upgrade it to amazing dad 10.0. That, that's the real reason. Why? Because I don't want to pass on my stuff to my kid. That's why. And so I had this idea that I was going to deal with my demons because my first, you know, 10 day was so amazing. So I had an agenda. You don't go to this type of meditation with an agenda, right? Because why? Because all we're doing truly, we're not trying to change anything. We're just learning how to observe. And there happens to be a change that begins happening on the background of that because we're, because you, you can't, 
stop paying attention to the things that are creating the suffering and pay attention to something else without the energy falling away from what we are. It's like we're learning how to hit the clutch, take the gear out of stress and put it over into, you know, easy riding, you know, as well. Um, and that's what we're learning. We're, we're, we're strengthening this muscle of not being in a story and learning how to switch. And in our studies of the brain, it's that mechanism of changing, shifting thought to a new perception and the strength to do that and to have a comfort and a conditioning of being able to do that that, that gives us so much space and, and ability uh, through any type of meditation process. Okay, so that is my... Uh, Review uh, my, my short intro to Vipassana meditation. I highly recommend that if this resonates for you, that you, you know, Google where one of the closest centers is and, you know, sign up for it. There's reasons why they don't accept people. It's not a mental health aspect. We're learning a technique that is a great primer for any type of mental health issue, things that we would want to process. And so, but there are also reasons for contraindications. They don't want people there that are going to be having breakdowns, things along those lines. So fill out the application, go to the site. And if that resonates for you, I, I hope it's a great journey. And as they would say, may all beings be have peace and be free from suffering. We'll see you guys in the next section. Take care. Hey guys, real quick, uh, I'm going to share this screen <clears throat> so that you can see. So if, you, if this did resonate with you and you are interested in, uh, if you do a search and I don't know wherever you're at, but if you're like, for example, uh, Southwest Vipassana uh, Meditation Center is the one in Kaufman. Do a Google search for those terms and it'll bring up this site right here, uh, Dhamma City and on this course, like they, they've got a 17 minute video of SN Goenka or 19 minute, I'm sorry, uh, provides a short explanation of the technique of a Pasana meditation. Uh, this is the, I think, address uh, 10850 County Road in Kaufman. Uh, and they have an application attending the course, a course checklist. All that information is right here on this particular page. If you're not in the Dallas area, I'm sure that wherever your area is, they probably somewhere on here, if you look, they'll have a uh, uh, a list of where other resources, well, there it is, worldwide locations. So this again would be a great place to start and it'll show you kind of how to proceed. So namaste, take care guys.